Parashat Terulah, if you will, open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. The book of Exodus, chapter 25. As this parasha begins, by Hashem telling, the, telling Moses to tell the people to bring them an offering uh, from whoever's heart is willing so that he can build, or that the children of Israel can build, a tabernacle for Hashem. As many of you know, we are... We are looking for our own permanent home. We don't have any clear direction on that, aside from the fact that we believe that by exit by this Nissan one, Hashem is going to have an answer for us. Whatever that answer is, we're happy with it. Amen? Baruch Hashem. So we're believing for that. But this morning, I want to take us to this passage because it says they collected gold and silver and precious stones. And so I want to do that this morning. Uh, no? Okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll give you a we'll wait on that. Gold, silver, precious stones. Would you take those? Amen? Baruch Hashem. But in seriousness, I, I, want to, I want to point out something to you that is immensely important as you are studying the word of the living God. This, what I'm about to tell you is could be, I think, the single most important principle that you need to pay attention to or know when you're studying Hashem's Word. Because if you don't take what I'm about to tell you to heart, then it creates problems, and I'll explain in just a moment. That that principle is this. Hashem is a God of pattern. And He shows us clearly in His Word His pattern. And He always follows his pattern. Always follows his pattern. And his pattern to us is critical because without it, we don't know what we're looking for. Right? So, for instance, he gives us patterns in the skies and so on. And he gives us patterns in the Word, of course. And so, when we're looking at the Exodus story, we see a pattern emerge. Many people don't realize this principle that I've just uh, told you, and as a result, they kind of view God as being, I don't mean to sound silly, but, but being a little loosey-goosey. He, kind of, he just kind of does stuff, and we take the scripture kind of out of context, and we say, well, God works in mysterious ways, which means that we can't, there's no way we can understand how God is supposed to act, and he acted a certain way 2,000 years ago, and he did something different then than he did 2,000 years previous to that. And who knows what he's going to do today. But that's not what Hashem says. In fact, in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, and let's turn there if we, if we, if we can, and of course we can. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Oh, they took it out of my Bible. Hold on a second. 1 Thessalonians. There we are. Chapter 5. It says, Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Now, let me just pause there and say something right quick. That there are a lot of uh, believers who come to an uh, incredibly awesome synagogue like Sar Shalom, and we teach them about the seasons, the Moedim of Adonai. And it's a great joy, and it's a great privilege, and it's a great honor. And most people, it's been my experience in all these years, that most believers who come in know little or perhaps nothing about these Moedim, and their eyes get this big, and they're just blown away and can't believe how incredibly awesome. And, you know, they say such things as, how come nobody told us this before? Or, Why am I just finding out about this? It's just as incredible. You know, the Passover Seder I mentioned, it's, if you've never been to a Pesach Seder, just, you know, strap on your kippah, wear a kippah thing, you know, because it's going to blow your kippah off. Ladies, kind of tighten your tackle because it'll blow your tackle off. It's awesome. And when you go through the festivals, you just sit, you know, like I do, even, even today, as many times we've walked through, and I just think, man, this is awesome. 
And yet we turn, turn to this chapter and we find the apostle saying, I don't need to tell you about this. Why is that? He goes on to say, for you know very well that the day of Hashem will come like a thief in the night. But why is he saying that you know very well? I don't need to talk to you about times and seasons. Let me explain why he says that. Now hold that place right there and turn to the book of Acts 15. The book of Acts 15. Now, the book of Acts 15 is where we receive the only four, not it was non-Jews, I guess people say, the only four requirements of a non-Jew. You can do anything else in the world but these four things. These are the only four things. This is what, this is what people believe. These are the only four things that you have to avoid doing. Everything else is, is up for grabs, right? <laughs> so he says here, uh, these are the four things. Ready? If you're not, if you're not a Jew, 15, sorry, 15, 19. 19, 15 was a good year. So was 15, 19. Close to the time my relatives left France. Je te le petit. In verse 19 it says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles to return into God. Sounds good. Amen. Instead, we should write them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat strangled, oh, excuse me, meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Those, that's it. There's your law. No, it's not true. I'm being facetious, of course. Many people teach that, and they just don't know what they don't know, and that's, that's cool. That's why we're here. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> but here's, here's what I want to get to. All, all kidding aside, this is what I want to get to. The reason that the apostle was able to write, I don't need to tell you about this, is because all of these non-Jews who were coming into the kingdom were going to a specific place to learn, and that place is called the synagogue. Amen. And this is what it says in verse 21. For... Moshe has been preached in every city from the earliest time and, say and, and, and is being read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. In other words, this is the entry point. you got to do these four things. This is your ticket in the door. Okay? And it all has to do with idolatry, by the way. Everything, all those four things I just mentioned, it's all about idolatry. But they're telling the, the non-Jewish believers who are now Jews by adoption... Here's your ticket in the door. And don't worry about it. We're not going to make it hard on you. You know why? Because you don't know what you don't know. And so when you come to the synagogue and learn, right. you're going to grow. And as you grow, you'll know. And this is why the apostle says, I don't need to write and talk to you about all this. Why? Because every Sabbath you're reading about it. Right. Now the book of 1 Thessalonians was written, let's just say here, my notes. I don't know. 51 AD, roughly. It's a big guess, by the way. Could be five or six years, one way or the other. But the book of 1 Thessalonians was written in approximately the mid-50s. Yeshua was resurrected about 33 AD. Do the math. Do the math. So if you lived in Thessalonica and you heard a report of the Lord, and let's just say... 40 A.D., and you believe God in 40 A.D. that Yeshua, sorry, that Yeshua is the risen Savior, then you would have got, you would have received this letter from the Apostle Paul about 11 or 12 or maybe 15 years later. So what scripture were you studying? The Tanakh. And so he says, I don't need to write to you because you know the day of Hashem is going to come like a thief in the night. Now, most people stop right there. This is why patterns are important. While people are saying shalom and safety, destruction will come on them, say them, yes. suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you. Say, but you. but you. But you. This this insinuates, infers, what's the other thing that Zechariah says? Implies that 
That, what we just read, is for somebody else. Doesn't apply to us. Doesn't apply to us. I've met many believers. I've even said it in my time. Well, you know, Yeshua going to come like a thief in the night. He better not to us. That's not good. If we're sitting around on the golf course, you know, and we put and all of a sudden, bam, he just shows up. We're like, he, he, he was coming? That's not good. Right? He says, but not to you, my brothers. Are, you are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Why are we not in darkness? Because we're in the light of the kingdom of his son. Yeshua is the light of the world. He was and is that light of creation that we read about in the first verse of Sheet. And what is that light? It's the Torah. And he's the Torah made, made flesh who currently, right now, dwells amongst us. I believe that the omnipresent God of creation is right here this morning. Amen. Shining light upon us. Because we're looking at his pattern, we're not deceived. He says, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to darkness. So then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Right. So as we're looking at the Torah, let us take note of the patterns that he's setting out for us. And let us apply that to our life. Now we've got some pretty incredible things that are signs in the heavens that are coming up this year. Many people have asked me about that. I'm going to give you my most professional and prophetic interpretation of those events. Based on everything that I've read in the last several years about it and, and you know, all that. This year, on Pesach and uh, also on the Feast of Tabernacles, I was going to mix up, could be next year that it's Feast of Trumpets or whatever, but on this year, we have a blood moon happening on Passover night, the 14th. And then again, during the feasts that are in Tishri. Okay? In Israel. In Israel. And then if next year, it's happening again. And I believe it's next year. I could be mistaken if I am. Don't write me any notes. Next year, it's on Feast of Trumpets, right? Somebody said that? Is that correct? This year's Feast of Trumpets? Same day. Same day. Same day. Okay, you can tell I'm confused, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, the important thing is, and I just want to make this a note, that for two years in a row, these blood moons are happening on festival days that are on the traditional Hebrew calendar. Not anybody else's calendar. Not no Zorite calendar or Lunite calendar or Chickamago Chik calendar, but on the Hebrew calendar, Amen. right? So make, just say And here's the thing. Somebody says, Rabbi, what does this mean? And here's my prophetic answer, my interpretation of this event. Are you ready? Amen. I don't know. <laughs> and here's what else I'm going to tell you. Nobody else knows either. Amen. Okay? We are all guessing and wondering. But here's the important part. It doesn't matter that we don't know. Because we don't know. But here's the important thing. Everybody in this room, and there's hundreds, of, perhaps thousands of other people who, like us, we are all cognizant of that fact. Yeah. And as a result, on Pesach night, when that blood moon is happening, we are all going to be doing this. Okay. Now, I'm personally convinced that the return of Mashiach is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Right. I believe that with all my heart. I'm prepared to be wrong, and I don't care, because either way, I won't be doing this. <laughs> and here's the thing that's even more important than what I just said. That night when that blood moon is happening, guess where all, we, where all of us are going to be? We're going to be having a Pesach Seder at the Hilton Garden Inn. And it could just be that when I raise the glass and say, this is the cup of redemption, we all go, whew. But I guarantee you, we're not going to be sitting home watching Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Nothing wrong with Duck Dynasty. I don't watch it, but I mean, I'm sure it's okay. I'm just, I'm just saying. We're going to be eating matzah, dancing, yes. listening to the violin guy. Yes. 
I mean, who knows what all? It gets crazy in Pesach. I mean, you know, we're living on the whole land at that point, amen? That's right. So we're, we're now in a, a part of the parashot where from this point forward, almost to the halfway point of the book of Bami Bar, which is the book of Numbers, that from now until then, the Torah is consumed with the tabernacle. I mean, every parasha is about the tabernacle or the service of the tabernacle or the clothing that the priests wear in the tabernacle, etc. And so do you think that if Hashem saw fit to occupy that much of His Torah with the Mishkan HaKodesh, do you think it might be important to us yes. as we're looking at it? And as we look at this part, portion, I want us to, to look at verse 8. Going back to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Then have them. So he's talking about after you received all this stuff, which by the way, they got all of this from Egypt. Yes. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Amen? Right. And so it says, then have them make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. Now this is very peculiar the way the Hebrew writes this. Because it says, have them make me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. It didn't say that I will dwell in the sanctuary. But I will dwell among them. See, the point of the sanctuary was that God wants to dwell amongst us. Amen. And even our he, he, Jewish sages, they even believed that every single home, every single synagogue, indeed every single individual was a mikdash me'at, a, a little sanctuary. Amen. That on Sabbath Eve, when the wives of our houses or the ladies of our homes walk up to the table and light the Sabbath lights, that is an allusion to lighting the menorah. Amen. That when, when our, our men of the house stand up to pronounce blessings, that's an allusion to the priest who stood up in front of the altar and spoke blessings. When he lifts up the the hala and speaks a blessing over the hala and breaks it. It's an allusion to the shulkan hapanayim, the table of his presence. The table of showbread. This, by the way, I just want to point out that on the Sabbath, the priests would eat the bread that was on the shulkan and fresh bread was put out when? Every Sabbath. See, if you wait till the first day of the week or the second day of the week or the third day of the week, you're getting stale bread. Amen. But the Bible says that the fresh bread was put out on the Sabbath and the bread that we eat, we eat on the Sabbath. So he says, make a tabernacle because I want to dwell among you. Now, here's the story. Just a, just a quick overview because I, I've said this just about every week for the last I don't know how many weeks. But there's no... More important story, and I realize that's a high bar, so I'm checking my mind to make sure that that's accurate. I think it is. But there's no more important story than the story of the Exodus, because it is absolutely the spiritual picture for us. Amen. It's a pattern for us. Amen. We were in slavery, and God set us free, ultimately by the blood of the Lamb. We went through the waters of baptism through the Dead Sea. And at that moment, God swallowed up death in victory. And we were set free from the fear of death. We went from there. We went to the bitter waters where he threw the branch in the water and made it sweet. See, right at that moment, the Torah, the water was bitter to us. And the way that we... See, here's the thing. Just about that point. The water, it's taught through history, it wasn't that the water itself was actually bitter, but rather that when we tasted the water, it was bitter to us. Yeah. And so Hashem told Moshe, take the tree and throw it in the water. 
And that he, he took the ets and he threw it in the water. The tree of life, the, the branch of the root of Jesse, Yeshua. And when you throw the, the branch in the water, all of a sudden, mm, the water's mm, sweet to us. The Torah is sweet to us. We want the Torah. Before we knew Messiah, we didn't want anything to do with his word. Oh, can I just take you somewhere right quick? Oh, man. I'm going to, so get ready. All right. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Be careful. I might just start going back to my roots and getting all excited. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't think I can't. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8. My wife will tell you. I got blood in my veins come from knowledge. Amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 7. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's Torah, nor can it do so. See, when we're all caught up in sin without Messiah, we can't submit. The water's bitter to us. But, it, but here's the good news. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of Elohim lives in you. See, that we're not controlled by the sinful nature, and if you're controlled by the sinful nature, then the Torah is bitter to you, but if you're not controlled by the sinful nature, you're controlled by the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that God's law is not bitter to you. You see the pattern here? So we went from bitter water that was made sweet to Mount Sinai where Hashem gave us his Torah and said, you're going to be for me a kingdom of priests. Now keep that phrase in your head for a second. A kingdom of priests. And this is how you're going to live for me. He gives them the Torah. Now if you have a kingdom, what do you got to have? A king. And so Hashem says, you know, here's my Torah. Be for me a kingdom of priests. I'll see you in 2,000 years. No. He says, now, I'm a king, and you're my kingdom, and I want to be with you. I want to be in the midst of you, so I need you to make me a throne. Yeah. I need a place, I need a throne set up so I can dwell in you and among you. Yeah. See, because a real king, a real servant leader, a, a real commander is in front leading this is why he said, I'm going to send my angel and lead you out of here. And Moses got down on his face before Hashem and said, no, 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 no. If you don't go with us, then don't send us. Yeah. And God says, okay. All right. I'll go with you. And so as they went forward to the promised land, what always went first? Now, before you answer that question, think about it. What went first as they went to the promised land? A lot of people answer this. They'll say, well, Judah went first. Pray, and Judah means praise and all that. That's not right. The first thing when they broke camp and started moving, the first thing that went forward was the priest holding the Ark of the Covenant. This is why, see, may, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this. But when our cantor stands up and we're retrieving the Torah from the ark and he says these words that when the ark would travel, Moshe would say, arise out of night. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. It says when the ark would travel. This is from this word of God. This is from scripture. Okay. The ark is a wooden box that's totally covered inside and out with gold. And when that box would travel, when the priest would pick it up and put it on their shoulders and march in front of the army, Moses would say, Arise, Adonai. Yeah. 
Was he talking literally about the box? No. He's talking about what the box represented. It represented the king who was going before his creation. Arise, Adonai, and let your foes be scattered. Let those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion the Torah will come forth. And the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim. Blessed is he who gave the Torah to his people Israel in his holiness. Amen. Whenever the, our forefathers would set out in the desert, Hashem went first. Because he wants to lead his people. He has given us his word. And he's also equipped us with his spirit. That's a prophetic picture you need to see. Some people say, well, do you have the Torah or do you have the Spirit of God? And the answer is yes. Amen. Are you led by the Torah or are you led by the Spirit? And the answer is yes. yes. They're in concert with one another. That's what the Apostle is writing in the book of, uh, of Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. I love those chapters. Because he says, if you are led by the Spirit of God, then you are going to be led into keeping the Torah. They're not mutually exclusive. They actually work in concert with one another. In fact, let's look at this verse if we can. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. Little known prophet. The book of Ezekiel chapter 36. Talking here about patterns. In verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Say spirit. Yeah. Put a new spirit in you. What spirit is this? It's the Ruach of God. That's what it's talking about. I'll put a new spirit in you and I will remove you. From you, you're a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And now, look what happens. Look at the result. Now we're going to talk about the result of what he just promised. Here's the result. And, say and. and. I will put my spirit in you. And, say and. and. Move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my Taurus. That's the promise. And so he says, I want to dwell amongst my people. And this Ark of the Covenant is what leads them. Don't you, don't you see the prophetic pattern? We're being led around by the Ark of the Covenant. And I want you to think about those words. Because one of my favorite superheroes, not really a superhero, but one of my favorite heroes growing up was Indiana Jones. I actually had a bullwhip for a while. I used to practice because I had this dream when I was a kid of being an archaeologist, climbing pyramids and stuff. I kind of do that now, but differently. Uh, actually, not at all the same, but in my mind, I'm still cool. But we think about the Ark of the Covenant, but I want you to think about that terminology. The Ark of the Covenant. Why is it called the Ark of the Covenant? Let's look. Verse 10 in chapter or Exodus 25, verse 10. First of all, let's back up one verse to verse 9. It says, Make this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly, say exactly, exactly. like the pattern I will show you. What does that mean? It means that every single thing about this tabernacle and every one of its articles and furnishings, they're all God designed. Amen. This menorah that we have here, my wife and I got from Israel last, last February, brought, brought it home with us. It's, it's a representation, it's modeled after the giant menorah that they have in Jerusalem under bulletproof glass that's going to be part of the next temple of Shem Willing. This menorah that you see right here is the best representation from the scripture. This menorah is God's design. See, we, we've got to understand that because it's not, 
It's not the idea of men. One of my favorite things to do when I encounter people who are uncomfortable with the idea of following the law of Moses or the law of God, as it's called. I often ask people, what is the law of Moses? What is the law of God? Because most folks have it in their mind subconsciously that the law of Moses or the, or the law is something that man made up. It's a bunch of rules by men. And so when you actually look at the scripture and, and take them to the scripture and they find out, wait a minute, this came from the mouth of God? The menorah, the design of it came from the mouth of the creator? It's pretty powerful stuff. Verse 10 says, have them make a chest of acacia wood. Acacia wood is very special. Acacia wood was a thorn bush. has big thorns on it. Some people speculate that possibly the crown of thorns that was placed on the head of the Shiok might have been an acacia branch. It would make sense. They're very, very big thorns. And it's, it's, it would be not very nice to have that. The, it's interesting that the only archaeological evidence that has been discovered in an ossuary in Jerusalem of a crucifixion victim, even though Rome crucified tens of thousands of people, there has been no archaeological evidence of a crucifix uh, device, tree, stake, whatever. The only, they found only one evidence in an ossuary in Jerusalem, and it's the ankle bone of a human man, male. And it had, it had a piece of wood inside that evidently had been a piece of the crucifix that he was on. Maybe a, a wedge piece and where they had nailed, and they found, I think, maybe the nail that was in the foot or whatever. But it just so happened that piece of wood was acacia. Acacia wood is a type of wood that does not decay. It is completely resistant to bugs. It was believed to have had healing powers. It was used in medicine and such, such things. And today, if you drink RC Cola, it has acacia in it. Amen. That's why it's called Royal Crown. Just saying. That may not be true. I'm just saying that. Have them make a chest of acacia wood two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it, fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark, and they are not to be removed. Then put in the ark of the testimony which I will give you. This ark has two primary functions. It is first and foremost to be the ark of the covenant, meaning that its primary function is to carry with it the tablets of the covenant. That's why it's called the ark of the covenant. Whenever they would see the ark going forth, the children of Israel were always reminded of the preeminence of the covenant that they have with the living God. And that covenant is articulated, enumerated, written in what we call the Torah. Secondly, it acted as the throne of God. God does not have a throne like we might think. He, when you walk... It, you know, it's not like you have a, a man sitting on a throne per se. But according to the book of Hebrews, in the 8th chapter, it says that the natural tabernacle was an exact replica of the one that's in heaven. This is his throne. His Shekinah glory of God hovers beneath the wings of the golden cherubim that are on top of what's called the mercy seat. And when you were to walk into the throne room of God, which only the high priest could do once a year, 
When you walked into his throne room, there was his glory hovering beneath the wings of the cherubim. And I want you to think about a spiritual picture, another pattern. All of the sacrifices all year long took place in the outer court. And we read about it in this week's Torah portion on what's called the bronze or brazen altar made out of copper bronze. All of the blood was shed out there and cast along the sides. They would slaughter the animals and cast the blood at the base of the altar. But once a year, the most important offering was offered up. It was called the Yom Kippur offering, the atonement offering. And it wasn't the blood of a lamb, but it was the blood of a goat. And this offering, the high priest would take that blood once a year and once a year only beyond the veil and into the Holy of Holies. And he would pour that blood on top of the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. And I want you to think about every single year that this happened. And think about the time that Yeshua, or excuse me, Hashem said in Leviticus chapter 16, gave the principles for this particular atonement day and everything that was supposed to happen. When you pour the blood, the atonement blood on the ark, the purpose was not to get rid of the ark of the covenant. The purpose of the blood being poured out was not to erase and wipe away the, the covenant tablets. The purpose was to make atonement for the people who had willfully broken the covenant. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because we talk about the atoning blood of Yeshua who went into the original tabernacle, not the copy. And he went into that original tabernacle where the original Ark of the Covenant stands right now. And he poured out his blood on that Ark. And it wasn't to erase the covenant. In fact, on that note, I just want to challenge you with something. Search the entirety of the Tanakh. Search the Brit of Kadashah as well. And find one place. Find a prophet, a righteous king, a patriarch, a matriarch, a hero, anyone of value who teaches that the Torah of God was something from which we need to be delivered or set free. Is there any prophet? Was there any king like David or King Solomon? Was there any hero like Devorah or Barak or Daniel or Elijah or Elisha? Did Abraham, Isaac or Jacob? Did Rebecca, Sarah, Rachel, Leah? Was any of those heroes, did any of them teach that this law is a burden and we must be delivered from it? No. Not one. Not one. You can't find any place in the entirety of Scripture where that would, where anybody would agree with that. Even the Apostle Shaul says, the Torah of God is holy, righteous, good, and spiritual. We're talking this morning about following a pattern and looking at the tabernacle and looking at the ark of God, which represents his covenant and understanding that even though today we don't have the ark of the covenant, even though physically today we don't have a physical tabernacle, but we've got one that we enter into every day in the spirit realm. And every single day when we set out our day to follow Torah, there Hashem is going before us. With his ark. With the ark of his covenant. And one final thing this morning. I want to share with you. And that is that. In scripture. Another principle. Another pattern. Is that. The first thing that's listed. Is in a series. Is always the most important thing. And in this particular case. Hashem is telling them, I want you to make for me a sanctuary because I want to dwell in your midst. <coughs> and the very first thing he starts to talk about is the Ark of the Covenant. Right. What does this tell us? It tells us that the entire tabernacle exists for the sake of the Ark. He doesn't start out by saying, I want you to make a tent, I want you to build the walls. 
Norm, I mean, if, we, if you're talking to a modern architect, you're talking about building a house, normally you begin with the foundation and you start to build from there, and then you talk about the furnishings. But not God. He said, this is how I want you to make the ark. Why? Because everything in the tabernacle, that's the focus. The reason you're making a tabernacle for me is for my throne. The entire reason. How, what does this mean for us on another spiritual level? If you think about the ark, and I'm, I'm closing with this. If you think about the, the tabernacle that is, what is it exactly? It is a building that ultimately is covered in skin as it's covering. And at the very heart of that skin-covered edifice is the covenant of God. Amen. Wrapped or overlaid in, the, in pure gold. Wood that is everlasting. It doesn't decay, doesn't die, doesn't rot. Hallelujah. What does it teach about us? It says that we are a tabernacle with skin. We're a temporary shelter. But in our core is something divine. Yes. In our core is what Hashem has done for us through Yeshua. Mm -hmm. He has put in our core something divine, something that lasts forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And He has put within us the Torah of Adonai. Mm -hmm. And His Spirit dwells in us just like it did in the tabernacle. And where His Spirit dwells, He leads us in all righteousness. So this morning, I want us to think about that fact. That we, our very selves, are a type of a holy mission. That when you look at yourself in the mirror, you see a human standing there clothed with skin. And Hashem says, so is my tabernacle. He said, well, I'm temporary. So was my tabernacle. Yeah. But look within your heart and see that what burns inside of you is the ark of his testimony. And everywhere you walk, everywhere you go, it's as if the tabernacle is walking around. Why? Because the spirit of the living God through Messiah Yeshua is in you. Yeah. And wherever you go, and as you're living a life of obedience to His Torah, you are shining light into darkness. Sar Shalom exists. And it's appropriate to say this because it's our birthday. Sar Shalom exists to strengthen families, to make disciples of Torah, to proclaim the living Messiah, you could say that Sar Shalom exists to help people realize and become a living Mikdash for Hashem through 